Welcome to everything for episode 3 in the Cradle of Vexalon. You will see that I'm back to my usual Starfield-esque background. That is because I am back home, I am in front of the normal green screen, and lessons have been learned. We are going to go through, of course, all of the ups and downs for this episode. Everyone, I hope you're enjoying Season 4 so far. Uh, I have to say, it's, as usual, it's coming out as a bit of a blinder. So, loving that. Um, just remember that every time you think about putting something on social media to do with Star Trek, will you throw hashtag save Star Trek Prodigy in front of it? I want to start with a big whopper of an up, which is we had the Kazinti from Larry Niven already. Now we've got the full on ring world itself. This massive superstructure that surrounds the star, this is effectively ring world from Larry Niven's novel. That novel features the Kazinti. It didn't introduce them, but it featured the Kazinti. As we know from me, having my fanboy moments about Kazinti in the past, Larry Niven created these creatures and then put them on loan to Star Trek for the animated series, The Slaver Weapon. And until Lower Decks, uh, except for a, a mention there in Picard, that was it. That was the last time we had heard or seen the Kazinti. They are back in the form of that lovely, lovely Ensign who turns up in this episode, Ensign Taylor, who is a Kazinti officer. You with me so far? Lovely. To me, Putting Ringworld, or well, the Star Trek equivalent of Ringworld, if you like, in this episode feels like, and forgive the pun, a full circle moment because it itself is a very Larry Niven creation featuring Kazinti, and I'm just, I'm just delighted that it's here. Plus, I just think it's an amazing design. It's, you know, been, it, it has inspired designs throughout sci-fi history you i mean to be fair i think the design of treasure planet from disney's treasure planet has a lot that it owes to ring world and of course the book of boba fett or the mandalorian season 2.5 featured a structure that was very similar to this as well all of that is just the opening moments of this episode so does the rest of the episode match up to this we see that the reason the Cerritos has arrived is that all of this time after first contact, they've arrived and actually they're going to try and help out the Coronosians. Yes? Coronos. Coronos. Cor they're going to try and help the inhabitants of this ring world fix their computer, who is the eponymous Vexalon. Y your first thought is kind of like... So we're getting a Landru? Yeah, yeah, getting a Landru? Cool. Yeah, maybe Agamus, something like that? Yeah. And actually, the twist here is that, no, Vexalon's actually benevolent. We like Vexalon. And Vexalon is a very kind caretaker. When Freeman and Ransom actually interact with Vexalon, uh, it's quite positive. But they do a bit of a walk through the town before that and all of the inhabitants they're all artists and poets but they've been so badly upset by Vexalon who's starting to glitch because Vexalon hasn't had maintenance in about a thousand years that they just can't focus I mean look at the state of these statues and you know sculptures that they're coming out with uh, oh, oh oh sorry no it's the other ones yeah uh, and as Ransom says just a amateurish lack of form Ransom the art critic that is an up from me. I just, I love Jerry O'Connell in this role. Mm-mm, mm-mm-mm, just dreadful, just dreadful. And you can see the artist's face. She's a bit put out by the fact that he's looked at her good work and deemed it such. We have Freeman and Ransom down on the planet. On the Cerritos, we've got Mariner, Rutherford and Tendi. And Boimler is actually leading his first away mission. Uh, he's got Talin with him, but he is he is leading the away mission down on Ringworld as well. So that's that's setting the stage where all of our you know, our friends are. Brother Vertendi and uh, Mariner, who look like they might have an afternoon off, and so they go to the anomaly room. Myself and Chris had a chat about this one, and we're going to give this one a down. So you might be like, oh, okay, right bloody killjoys. This anomaly room is said to be we're housing things before we can give them back to the rightful owners. Okay, all right, right, so that idea itself, not the end of the world. But, I mean, nomads in there. 
the Romulan cloaking device from the original series. The, these are not things that would just be lying around a ship. And that's what Ardan was like. This was the setup for kind of a funny museum episode or, you know, kind of like, ah, wacky trinket does wacky thing, which of course we get to in this episode. And it just kind of, ugh, why is this in a storage closet? Now, I have not forgotten the fact that we did have Nomad back in season one as well. So if we just take Nomad, which also isn't Nomad because it exploded at the end of the Changeling. I am going somewhere with this. We we do not feel that this would be on the Cerritos or on any starship, to be honest. Uh, this should be under lock and key. There is the potential for a lot of flipping danger in this room. So even if the Ensigns don't have access to it, you wouldn't really want anyone to have access to it. In this room, it's a veritable what's what of Star Trek history. So stick around for cetacean observations. What it does have is a Betazoid gift box. I'll go into that a little bit in the Cetacean Observations, but I've got a down, all right? So the original box was played by Armin Zimmerman in his second appearance in The Next Generation. It doesn't have many lines this episode. You could have asked him for a voice note. You know, at the risk of being called an absolute buzzkill, let me give a whopping up to this idea of a prank war that's going on on the ship. Tendi, Mariner and Rutherford get assigned by the Lieutenant to individually scan every one of the isolinear chips in this little room from hell. And those chips are hot. And they, there's one, there is one chip that needs, that needs replacing. And there's also Billups Ferret is in there as well. This is, this is kind of like the claustrophobics room from hell. And, I mean, it's hard to argue, it's a bit fun, really. Tendi is sure from the beginning that this is a hazing ritual, whereas both Marin and Rutherford are a bit like, ah, come on, that's not really Starfleet. Starfleet wouldn't do any hazing. <laughs> Back down with Freeman and Ransom on the planet, Freeman has decided, I know, I'll go and have a look at the actual operating system and we'll do a bit of a safety check. And, oh my God, she accesses the console and those giant floppy disks are sitting there taken up first of all now sorry a floppy disk for a certain age of this audience is what we used to save things on in fact for your point of view it would look like a giant 3d printed save button from your computer yeah they used to be real and we used to slot them in and out of the computer and they would store up to several megabytes of technology and information uh, and sidebar, I used to work in a company, which I can name because they've gone out of business at this point. It was called Extravision, right? It was an offshoot of Blockbuster Video. And for a time, every day that you would switch on the computer, you would have to back up the information. 18 floppy disks to uh, upload all of the information for the day. This was post 2000, folks. So yes, floppy disks have a, a certain place in my memory. Taken up to Boss Boimler as well. Not just because he is, even as a Lieutenant Junior grade, it's like his neuroses got a bit of a promotion as well because now he's not just responsible for himself, but for his team. And he's excited. He's trying to work on his confidence boosting procedure or ritual as Talyn calls it, even if Boimler might disagree with her, it totally is. He needs to go and show by example. And at this point, you're kind of thinking, oh, good for you. Go on the Bradward and he's going to be everyone's friend. And yeah, let's see how that goes throughout the episode. Just something that really made me smile as well. When, you know, poor Vexelon is struggling to modify all of the uh, the weather patterns on Ringworld before Freeman ever even got there. That, sorry, the, the river goes backwards and the overlooking mountain, Inspiration Peak, becomes an island. That was an up for me. I, I just really enjoyed that. Mariner and Rutherford have started to twig that, hold on, especially when the lieutenant comes back in and says, oh, have you scanned the second deck of isolinear chips yet? The walls raise and they have to start every, well, not start everything from the beginning, but basically double up on all of their work. And they're like, okay, we might be getting hazed here. And so they nipped the anomaly room and they set up a bit of a trap for the lieutenant, which is by wiring a Wadai Chula game with the gift box, the Betazoid gift box, and it's hooked up to a phaser. It's so elaborate, and I love it. 
I, I love it so much that when they walk out of the quarters with the trap ready to go and they walk straight into him, he nearly has a breakdown because he's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, thank you so much for doing all the ice linear chips because like anything could go wrong at any point and you know, if we don't scan them properly and something goes wrong, it could be fatal, it could explode and um, and then I couldn't do tight spaces because I got trapped in a Wadai Chula game for a month. Up. It's just... Even when you know where this is going, this scene just works because you just have the growing realization of horror on each of their faces. And Mariner manages to distract him by going, oh, uh, I believe you're into Tellerite's lap jazz. Uh, let's uh, tell me all about that. Fix it. Oh my God. I, yeah, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Tendy runs off to the ice linear chip room to get those scans done. Meanwhile, Rutherford runs into the quarters, trips the Wadi Chula game and... Mm, I've waited 30 years for this song to return to Star Trek. Alan Moraine, count to four. Oh God, I love it. You've been obviously taken up. Um, and like, we have Rutherford doing speed running through this game, which is just fantastic. Because also, like, we as an audience, we know how to play the game of Chula. Down on the planet, what you've got then is Boimler's really struggling to loosen the reins or let go of the reins or basically let his team do anything. So he says, oh, I know, I will show you what to do single-handedly so that you can do it right. Okay, I mean, it is a style of leadership, possibly not mine, but it is a style. And so he, he runs away and says, right, did you catch that? And they were like, no, not really. And they're like, I oh, know, I'll try it again. These power cells that he's working on to try and remove these extraneous cylinders um, they're a bit volatile, and so if anything goes wrong, they could explode. And if they explode, he will be responsible for continuing the trend of the first Lieutenant Junior Grade away mission mortality rate. Yes, you heard that right. Mortality rate. And it is provisional Lieutenant Junior Grade to Lin who is trying to reason with him because he's not letting his team do anything because his neuroses have taken over. And she queries, what you're doing is not efficient, so therefore your course of action is not logical. For you to do all of the work and not trust your team does not make sense. And, you know, he's like, yeah, but no one's going to die on my watch. And it becomes so important because Freeman, who thought it was a great idea to just, oh, I know, I will reboot and I will update your operating system. Everyone's grand. What do you mean it's frozen? So Vexlon goes offline. You see outside these lovely constructed clouds freeze and drop. Suddenly all of these rapidly changing seasons throughout of Ringworld as well. Reminds me of another planet that went through an awful lot of changing seasons in a really short space of time, but I just can't think of what it was. Where did the genesis of that idea come from? Billups beams down and he's like, all right, Grant, maybe is there a safe mode? She, Freeman goes in and says, oh, I'll put it in safe mode, it'll be great. And then what she actually manages to do is completely reboot Vexelon. But that also means Vexelon believes that they need to restart the world, which means releasing the primordial goos and getting the fjords going and getting miasma and everything. Bad stuff. Bad stuff. So they need to reset Vexelon to where it was meant to be, which means Freeman to Boimler. Gotta need you to put all those cylinders back, uh, Lieutenant Junior Great. I was going to say Ensign. Lieutenant Junior Grade, because we've got to get it back to the way it's supposed to be. So can you organize that, please? Uh, you can, I mean, you can feel his sadness. It's like, Boimler being Boimler, he starts to redo the work on his own. Now, this time it's because basically hell is raining around them. And you have this fantastic moment, sorry, where Talin is standing there and we see the birth of a mountain or a volcano. The top of it explodes. Hmm. It is a volcano then. Taken up. I love the delivery of humor. Thankfully... Talin manages to slap a bit of sense into Boimler. Part of the whole thing of taking command is you need to be able to not only delegate, but see the strengths within your team. And as it stands, as they have not been able to do anything, it is impossible to see the strengths within their team. She very logically states that she looked through 
his file and his reason for being promoted. And she believes Ransom was 100% correct to promote Boimler. Uh, so just really quickly, let's take an up for Talyn. She knows how to give a pep talk without there being a rousing speech involved. And she manages to bring him around to go, what you're doing is not commanding, it is micromanaging. You need to work on this. And she convinces him that, you know, risk is part of the job. And he takes from this that, all right, okay, team, Talyn says I've got to put you in danger. That is not how I would have phrased that. My latinum up for the week is Talyn. Like, we were so excited for Talyn to join the crew of the Cerritos. And I have to say, I am delighted. I think she's brilliant. I think that she is a really good addition to the team. And particularly here in this episode, I just love her deadpan logic next to Boimler's barely concealed panic. And it absolutely works. While all of this kerfuffle is going on, you've got Rutherford finally gets to the end of the game of Chula. He's got the gift box who've been dragged in with him for this whole time. He jumps off the cliff, as we know that you're supposed to do at the end of Chula, and he arrives back in the uh, lieutenant's quarters. And just as he gets out, the probe drops from the ceiling. This is something I'm actually going to address right here uh, as a teaser, I guess, for cetacean observations. This, it, it drops from the ceiling and fires a beam. Now the beam hits the Betazoid gift box fresh in the face. It sort of resets and goes, was that an entire simulated life? I miss my wife. There's a few things here. First, all right, Lower Decks, that was a lot of fun. You get two I miss my wife's in a season. This was the second one. Hope you enjoyed it. Two, if you were to look at that probe, we had a great debate over, is this a Catan probe, much as like the Inner Light, which has appeared in Lower Decks before, back in the second season, it was in the Collector's Guild Museum. The difference being, rather than four prongs, that was a two-pronged probe designed by Rick Sternbach for the Inner Light. Obviously, its purpose was to beam the life of Cayman into whoever it encountered, this being Captain Picard in the Inner Light, and seemingly, if this is a Catan probe, does the same thing here with the Betazoid gift box. It beams it something directly into the gift box's face, which would suggest, yes, Catan probe. The problem is there's four prongs on this one. And it's just different enough that we wonder, I mean, you could have just used the, you know, the image of the original. So is this something else altogether? And to say that I scanned through images of probes and Chris scanned through images of probes and we, we didn't find one that matches the configuration of this completely. What we did find, sort of going back a good bit, is that one of the player pieces from the game of Chula looks like this cut in half, as in it has the two uh, prongs, if you like, on one half of it. So is this, in fact, a giant additional piece from the Chula game doubled up in this configuration? And what it beams into the Betazoid gift fox's head is a lifetime in the Chula game. The answer is, we don't know. So you're going to see a couple of things added to cetacean observations, but it needed to be explained. Here it is. Shall we go back to the episode? After this kerfuffle with chulas and probes and everything, Rutherford is almost good to go. He's got everything packed up to get it out of the quarters. Outside, Mariner has done her absolute best to keep the lieutenant talking about slop jazz and scuzz blues and everything like that. And he stood outside his own door before he realizes, that, wait a minute, he has an appointment with Miggly Moo on the other side of the ship and didn't need to be there at all and walks away. And Rutherford just collapses outside the door. And then you just see the thumb comes up like this, thumbs up, taken up, down on the planet. Freeman is almost ready. Boimler has finally got his crew. They've inserted all of the uh, cylinders back where they're supposed to be. Suddenly, unfortunately, the turbine starts going overloading and he has to runs up and says, right, everybody out. At this point, Talyn recognizes this as, this is an order. This is an order from a Lieutenant Junior Grade. Everyone out of the room. He stands there ready to hit emergency shutdown. Freeman says, now Boimler, now you do it. He hits the button and the building explodes. Sorry, what? Yeah, it goes boom. No, I'm not kidding. Boimler dies. Lieutenant Junior Grade Bradbury Boimler dies in this episode. I'm not kidding. He's dead. So if we're doing a death count, 
that's one. That's one for Boimler. Um, and we know he's dead because we follow him to where he goes. And he's sitting in a waiting room. Through the window, there is the famed Black Mountain. And as he turns, he sees the great koala waiting to speak to him. It's unintelligible and sends him back. He wakes up and to Anna goes, I can't believe that worked. Up. I love it. I love it. His first mission as a Lieutenant Junior Grade and he dies. And Ransom's like, congratulations. The only more dangerous missions from here. And he goes, oh, jeez. And he dies again. And to Anna goes, give me 30 cc's of whatever just worked the last time. This is such a silly episode. Uh, I mean, the final reveal that, yes, the, you know, the lieutenants were screwing with you know, Mariner, Rutherford and Tendi is just... Yeah, like, I mean, of course, but this is such a silly episode. It's both high stakes and low stakes. We have a death of a major character who then is resurrected seconds later, which is kind of like, I'm not really sure how to feel about that one. Uh, in a, it's good. We love that the fact of like, oh, does this mean he counts as like senior bridge staff now because he saw the Black Mountain? I'm just going to go to Cetacean Observations before stuff gets weird. <laughs> Citation observations this week, beginning with... So, Ringworld, which I've already mentioned. The idea of Vexilon being a benevolent god. Uh, to me, that was an up. The, the artist references, sometimes we get blue skies. Boss Boimler, which is a callback to when Boimler's trying to be uh, nice and confident. Those power cells on Ringworld, I mean, if they aren't the warp core of the NX-01, I don't know what is. In the Anomaly Room, we've got a Medusan casket. We've got that Medusan visor that we saw last week while poor Boimler was trying not to see the red of the nacelles. The Wadai Chula game. We have, I, I say Nomad, a probe in the Nomad configuration. We have a Vulcan Lerpa. So basically, my big... The big explanation I gave before is because we have here Catan-ish probe slash giant chula piece. We have a Batleth, we have a Betazoid gift box, a Romulan original series cloaking device. Mariner had me in bits when she was like, oh, it's the game that makes you go, la la la, lemon meringue. Up. <clears throat> Vexilon, when describing his original creators, says that they are... Fifth dimensional being! Everyone knows there are only five dimensions. We are told this by Chaotica. The trees outside are very animated series style. We have, of course, the Kazinti taken up, Ensign Taylor. The switching from day to night. Now, obviously, we've got what's going on on Ringworld overall, but specifically that day to night switch, it made me think of the Voyager episode in the flesh. We have Tellarite, Slop Jazz, Ala Moraine. We have the artist who overdosed on Ketracel White. I'm sorry, that's hilarious. Shap 4, which is described by the character who looks quite like Fallow from Move Along Home. Um, I miss my wife. The Black Mountain. All right, take another up. The Koala. And of course, Tana's using a hyperspray as well. Overall, what's going on in Ringworld? To me, it's, it's Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. You have jungle beside blizzard, beside arid, beside volcanoes. I mean, this is effectively the shutdown of the Genesis planet. <laughs> That's everything for our list this week, folks. What did you think? What are you thinking of Lower Deck Season 4 so far? Are you excited for the rest of the season? I am. Let us know what you thought in the comments below. Let us know as well over on social media. We are at Trek Culture on Twitter. We're at Trek Culture YT on Instagram. I am at Sean Ferrick on Twitter. And of course, we have at Edit Chris Edit on both Twitter and Instagram. You are awesome. You are lovely. Make sure that you live long and prosper. It would be only logical. Our friends in Ukraine, Slav Ukraine, everyone everywhere it's been actually a shockingly uh, a lot has happened in the last couple of weeks throughout the world please be safe please check in with friends and family make sure that you are looking after everyone that you can take the breaks come here and take your break when you need we are here to entertain as much as we can and outside please just just be well and stay safe everyone until i see you again have a wonderful week. Make it so. Alamorain, count to four. Alamorain, then three more. Alamorain, then you'll see. Alamorain, you'll come with me.